Okay. Uh, well, uh, it is a privilege to address everyone about a subject that I feel very passionate about. Uh, for the past oh, 30 plus years in my medical practice, I've been watching uh, severe or organic diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, clogged arteries, inflammatory diseases, uh, resolve uh, diseases I was told never uh, go away. Uh, they are uh, relentlessly progressive. And I've become aware of just the appalling, embarrassing lack uh, that my fellow physicians have when it comes to the effect of our patients' daily diet upon their bodies and the diseases they are bringing us to treat. So I've been going around. Uh, as part of our nonprofit uh, Moving Medicine Forward initiative, been going to the nation's medical schools and hospitals and clinic and telling the young docs that uh, med school, you're going to learn all these diseases from smallpox to leprosy. But when you open the door in practice, no matter what specialty you're in, any of these column on the left or the right, every one of these folks, when they look in their waiting room, who's sitting there, Mr. and Mrs. America, uh, they're mathematically going to be either overweight or clinically obese. They're going to have clogged arteries showing up as angina and claudication and strokes, uh, as well as elevated fats in the blood, high blood pressure. You'll see rampant type 2 diabetes and a, uh, and a host of inflammatory diseases affecting every organ system, lungs, gut, uh, joint, immune system. Uh, and yeah, these are the diseases that are uh, responsible for most of the time and energy being absorbed by Western medicine. But when you ask the professors what's the cause of these diseases, you run into two words to stop all further thought, etiology unknown. We don't know the cause of these diseases. Uh, and if you don't know the cause of the disease, you can't cure it. You, it reduces the doctor to the manager of chronic disease, will manage your high blood pressure, will manage your diabetes. What an unsatisfying way to practice medicine. And the message you give the patient every time you see them in a month and you raise their dose of beta blockers and raise their dose of insulin is you're going to be sick the rest of your life. You're never going to get better. Uh, and you'll take these pills the rest of your life. What a dismal, hopeless way to practice medicine. And it's actually unnecessary because these are actually all eminently reversible diseases. And the professors in the back of the room with their arms full of say, we don't know the cause of these diseases. Really? I say, doctors, take a look at what your patients are eating. Uh, I wish when I was in med school, some resident or internal medicine professor sat me down and said, let's talk about the reality of what your patient's daily diet is doing to their bodies uh, and, uh, and how it fits in with these diseases you're treating. So as I explained previously, if one starts, uh, one eats a plant-based meal, a nice colorful salad, here's bean and vegetable soup, here's quinoa and zucchini bows, here's green yellow veggies. You eat a meal like this, and an hour later, I sneak up on you with a needle and a syringe in my hand, and I draw five cc's of blood into a glass top tube, and let it clot, and spin it down in a centrifuge. Uh, we're, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see the red clot at the bottom. The liquid part of the blood is transparent. You can read newsprint through normal serum. This is what your blood should look like. You have to eat a fatty meal. But you eat a standard Western meal, bacon, eggs for breakfast, a cheeseburger and fries for lunch, a dinner of fried chicken or a pizza, ice cream for dessert. You eat a meal like this. And for the next five hours, your blood is running thick with fat. Uh, it has this milky appearance to it. It's technically called postprandial lipemia. Lipemia means fat in the blood. Postprandial means the after eating. Now, Grant, not everybody shows it this optically densely, but everybody has a wave of fat that goes through their arteries after we eat a meal. How else is it going? Where else is it going to go? Uh, and I was serious about that five hour number. Here's Kuo's classic study, they gave someone a fatty meal at hour zero, and they drew blood once an hour for six hours, and they took those blood tubes and put them one after another into an instrument, a spectrophotometer that measures how fatty, how milky the blood is looking. And you can see the blood getting fattier and fattier and fattier and fattier. It takes the liver five hours to begin, begin to clear the fat out of the blood. And during this time when the blood is running thick with fat, evil things are happening in the body. Um, the, um, 
the artery walls are getting injured from the oxidized cholesterol and saturated fat that opens the door to atherosclerotic plaque formation. I'll show you uh, the story of that in a minute. Uh, the fat flows to the abdominal fat tissues and sticks there, increasing obesity. The fat works its way into the liver and muscle cells, clogging up insulin receptors, uh, increasing uh, type 2 diabetes. I'll show you more about that in a minute. And the saturated fats fan inflammatory reactions throughout the body. There's a pro-inflammatory diet. And for five solid hours, uh, this kind of damage is being done. Well, think about what that means. The way most people conduct their eating day, they start out with bacon and eggs or an egg McMuffin or something fatty. And for the next five hours, all morning, their run, blood is running thick with fat, their arteries are injured, obesity is increasing, diabetes, inflammation going up. Takes the liver till about noontime to begin, begin to clear the breakfast time fat out of the blood. When time for lunch and another wave of fat goes through the bloodstream and all the afternoon, the arteries are injured, obesity is increasing, diabetes and inflammation getting worse takes the liver till about six in the evening to begin, begin to clear the lunchtime fat out of the blood when time to visit the colonel and send another wave of fat through the bloodstream and all evening, arteries are injured, obesity is increasing, diabetes and inflammation getting worse. It takes till about 10 o'clock at night for the liver to begin to clear this fat out of the blood when on the way back to the bedroom, we polish off a half pint of ice cream and send another wave of fat through the bloodstream. And the truth is when any doctor opens the door, they're waiting in an emergency room, outpatient clinic, it doesn't matter. The people who are sitting there um, have generally have blood that looks like this. How do I say that? Because we are an affluent society and hunger is just not tolerated. If you're at home and you're hungry, you put your head in the fridge for last night's dinner leftovers. If you're out, you head for the convenience store or the restaurant. We do not put up with hunger in our society, no matter how junky the food might be that we put in our system. And as a result, we are constantly in the postprandial state. Uh, and knowing that that's the state of the American bloodstream, we need to drill down further. Now, I've been focusing on the fat because that is the most visible uh, of the substances in the bloodstream to show how long each meal affects our physiology. But there's much more than fat in that blood. Uh, it is a high salt diet. There's uh, salt in the meat, salt in the cheese, salt in the fries, salt in the chips, salt in the spaghetti sauce at the Italian restaurant. It's a high salt diet that stiffens our arteries and makes us retain fluid, then raises our blood pressure, increases our risk for heart attacks and strokes and congestive heart failure and kidney failure. But also we're learning that high sodium diets set off TH17 helper cells that open the door to autoimmune diseases like lupus. High salt diets are not good for the human system. Who knew? But we know now. So that's the problem with eating too much salt during the day. And then there's eating sugar. Now, I'm not talking about a half a teaspoon of sugar of, of syrup in your coffee for a sweetener. That's how it's supposed to be used as a flavoring. I'm talking about eating sugar as a food. When you eat a, even a vegan donut or a cupcake or a chocolate bar or drink a cola drink, you are flooding your system with grams and grams of fructose, maltose, dextrose, highly oxidizable sugars. And that, and those sugars stick to proteins all over the body. They glycosylate the proteins all over the body, in your blood, your tissues. And that's not a good thing. That stiffens and injures the protein. But then your own 98.6 body heat takes these glycosylated proteins and does a low-grade reaction, what's called the Maillard reaction, that every baker knows. Uh, in, in the bakery, they combined carbohydrates in the pastry flour, well, along with protein and the wheat gluten, uh, and it glycosylates the protein, and they put it in the oven and heat it. And then uh, that glycosylated protein oxidizes, and it forms advanced glycation end products like acrylamides and other damaging substances that are teeming with free radicals that rip electrons off, off your cells and off membranes and off chromosomes and protein. Destructive molecules, these AGEs, don't worry about the initials so much, remember uh, the, the names so much, but remember the initials because these things age you. It's one thing to make AGEs on the surface of a French baguette. You don't want to eat a lot of bread crusts for that reason. But you sure don't want to run the Maillard reaction in the 
proteins of your crystalline lens of your eye. It's a great way to open the door to cataracts. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the elastin fibers of your skin. It's a great way to turn your skin into an old suitcase. And you sure don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the inner lining of the blood vessels to your brain. I'll show you what that does uh, to the, the vessels that have to transport oxygen into your brain cells. Um, the You can create... Uh, you can get exposed to these AGEs in two ways, by eating sugars and letting your body heat run the Maillard reaction on your own proteins, or you can eat carbohydrates that have been cooked at high temperature, like potato chips that are teeming with free radicals. So we bombard our tissue with these free radicals by uh, consuming carbohydrates that have been processed. This does not happen when you eat an apple. It doesn't happen when you eat a mango or a, a potato. This, these are processed concentrated sugars that have been processed with heat. But it turns out that these cooked carbohydrates are not the main villains. They're not the main source of AGEs in a diet. You know what it is? Cooking animal muscle at high temperature, grilling the burger, frying the chicken, grilling the bacon. These generate more AGEs than any uh, potato chip could ever contain. And most Americans and people in all Western countries, Australia, UK, Canada, they're at least once or twice a day eating a meal like this and then flooding their tissues uh, with all these AGEs. As I said, you don't want to run the, the, the Maillard reaction interlining your blood vessels in the brain. Here are the arteries of two men who died of, uh, who died at the same age. These are brain arteries, the middle cerebral arteries. Uh, this man up here did not have Alzheimer's dementia. This man down here did. And you can see the difference in the artery walls, and you can see how thickened and inflamed and swollen these, arteries wall, uh, these artery walls are. And if you stain for them, you can see how thick they are with these advanced glycation end products and the damage they cause. There's a big vascular component to Alzheimer's. And the standard Western diet of meats and sugars and oils and dairy and processed food year after year after year surely is a contributing factor to winding up with Alzheimer's dementia in your later years. Um, now, um, so I'm pointing this out because vegan junk food, the, the chips and the pastries and the fries and the, and the processed foods can be really damaging from all the AGEs and the salt and uh, oxidized uh, proteins, etc. So just because you're vegan doesn't mean you're 100% healthy. On the contrary, that's why we talk about whole food plant-based. You want plant foods that you can recognize like they grew in the garden. Oh, there's a tomato. There's a there's a there's lettuce. There's a cucumber. That's the whole plant foods we're talking about. These nothing in this uh, in this image here uh, are whole plant foods. That's for sure. So uh, there's a, a pitch about avoiding vegan junk food. But that's not what most Americans eat on a daily basis. Most Americans, Canadians, Brits, Aussies, Kiwis, uh, they eat a diet based on animal flesh. And once you add meat into the diet on a regular basis, you are you now unleash an entire new tier of molecular marauders that flood through your tissues with every meal. Let's look at just some of them. I could spend two lectures on this one slide alone, but here's what flows through every tissue in your body with every meat-based meal. First of all, nobody eats raw meat. Um, the very act of, of broiling the steak and grilling the chicken and, uh, and frying, uh, frying the chicken and grilling the burger oxidizes the cholesterol in the animal muscle. I'll show you in a few minutes how, how atherogenic the oxidized cholesterol particles are. When you put a, a piece of animal muscle under a broiler on a grill, you oxidize the glycogen and nucleic acids and you create Reactive aldehydes, glyoxal and acrolein, these are mutagenic. They damage your genes. These are the genes that call forth the enzymes in your cells that make all your chemistry happen. Why eat something that damages the genes in all your cells with every meal? But uh, that's what cooked meat does. Steaming broccoli doesn't do this. Making rice or boiling oatmeal does not do this. It, it's uh, But cooking animal muscle at high temperatures do. New 5-GC is the sialic acid that only animals make. It sets off inflammatory reactions throughout the body. Our paleo friends are giving themselves a shot of new 5-GC three times a day or however often they eat meat. Endotoxin, nasty molecule. Uh, where does that come from? Uh, it comes from the slaughterhouse. 
um, uh, every carcass, cows, pigs, chickens, whatever it is, as the as the intestinal tract is pulled out, as the carcass is eviscerated, it's inevitable you get spillage of the of the of the stomach contents. And as a result, on every cutting surface in the slaughterhouse, you can take a culture swab and swab that surface, and you'll get a luxurious growth of E. coli and Salmonella and Shigella and Enterococcus clostridia, Pseudomonas, the entire rogues gallery of enteric bacteria form a coating of bacteria on every steak and chop and chicken breast that leaves the meat packing plant. Why is that important? Because that piece of meat is wrapped up in clear plastic, put in the meat case of your local market, where the ultraviolet light shines down and kills the bacteria. As these bacteria die, their cell walls break up, and that releases this nasty lipopolysaccharide called endotoxin. Uh, any doctor who spent time in the intensive care unit knows about endotoxic shock, how it kills patients. Um, just walk around this daisy of distress to see what endotoxin does. Uh, releases free radicals, it depresses heart function, it releases histamine, it releases tumor necrosis factor, makes your blood clot. Nasty stuff, endotoxin. And it's heat stable. Grilling a burger, uh, broiling the steak does not get rid of the endotoxin. And again, our paleo friends are giving themselves a shot of endotoxin three times a day. And endotoxin makes your gut leaky uh, and it increases intestinal permeability. It lets food proteins and bacterial cell wall proteins leak out into your, into your immune system. And that then forms antibodies against tissues that, uh, that cause inflammation uh, throughout the body. Uh, endotoxin is not, uh, not your friend to say the least. And a meat-based diet is inherently uh, laden with endotoxin. TMAO, what is that? Um, that is the molecule created by the microbes, the bacteria in your gut that gets summoned up. If you're eating uh, meat and eggs on a regular basis, then you're eating lots of carnitine and choline. Well, that's going to summon up microbes in your gut, like peptostreptococci and clostridia, now, who love eating carnitine and choline. They will turn it into a substance called trimethylamine, that your liver then oxidizes into trimethylamine oxide. This is a molecule from hell that drives cholesterol into the artery walls, increases risk for heart attacks and strokes and sudden death. And it turns out that as you might expect, uh, increased levels of TMA, uh, increased risk of major adverse cardiac events and all-cause mortality. Well, how about the folks who eat lots of meat, like the paleo folks? Well, check their TMAO levels. You'll find they're walking around with high levels of TMAO uh, in their bloodstream. We are not carnivorous apes, no matter what they tried to tell us, uh, no matter what they think the caveman ate. We were starchivores back then. We're starchivores now. Uh, and the cooking of animal muscle inevitably creates carcinogenic cancer-causing amines that smear on the stomach wall, give you gastric cancers, on the colon wall, give you colon cancers. When you eat concentrated protein like meat is, and all the amino acids um, flow up into the liver, the liver responds by putting out a surge of a hormone insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. This is one of the most potent growth-promoting hormones in the body. Uh, great if you're a growing 11-year-old girl, not so great if you're an adult woman with uh, early breast cancer growing or a guy with a big prostate with some malignant cells in there. The last thing you want is a diet that makes you walk around with high levels of IGF-1. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire, but that's what a meat-based diet does. The heme iron makes red meat red. It increases the risk of strokes and cancers. Don't have time to go into the mechanism. But the animals in the feedlot are fed bushels of grain sprayed with herbicides and pesticides. They drink water with lead and mercury and cadmium in it. They're given hormones and antibiotics and growth promoters. All these substances bioaccumulate in the animal's muscles. So when you bite into that burger, uh, that finger licking good chicken and breast, uh, you're eating all the concentrated pesticides and herbicides and, and growth promoters that animal is fed. So this is what flows through your tissues with every meat-based meal. I call it the postprandial red tide. Again, postprandial is after eating. This is the red tide that flows through all your tissues. I could spend two lectures on this one slide about all the components of the, of the red tide. I've had a number of them already. But it's a fatty tide. It's a salty tide. It's a sugary tide. 
It's it's antigenic, so it's autoimmune reactions. It's acid forming. It's full of sulfates and phosphates that form acids. It's mutagenic, damages your genes. It's carcinogenic, sets off cancers. It's atherogenic, clogs arteries. It's pro-inflammatory for sure. And it disrupts enzyme system in all the cells of the body. This is what we inflict on ourselves with every meat-based meal. Now, when a real flood tide is going through your house, you get concerned for the stain that's going to get left behind in your carpet and your baseboard and your walls. Well, the red tide leaves its own kind of tie of uh, stain behind. Um, the food effects over time equal the health effects. And if you're eating three meals a day over the course of a year, that's over a thousand times a year you flooded your tissues with these red tide marauders that cause molecular disruption on so many levels. And so I tell the med students and the young physicians, when you open the door in the clinic in the examining room and you walk in, who's sitting there? You see the man with the angina, the asthmatic lady even using her inhaler, the man with the diabetes injecting insulin, the woman grieving over the, the scarred of face from acne. Etiology unknown, really? Uh, knowing what we know, are we not looking at the repeated effects of, um, of red tides flushing through the tissues again and again and again? Food effects over time equal the health effects. Food is so powerful. Within minutes of eating anything, molecules of that food are flowing through every cell in our body where your DNA lies unfolded, where all your genes are exposed. And the food molecules wash through your cells and they wash over your DNA and they play your DNA like a piano. And the food molecules turn genes on, they turn genes off. They induce enzymes, they shut enzymes down. This is what epigenetics is. And... Every meal brings in not only nutrition, it brings in information. Every meal changes us on a genetic molecular level. And you don't need to be a geneticist to understand that the genes that are going to be turned on by this broiled steak with all the oxidized fats and aldehydes and new 5GC and endotoxin and, and AGEs, the genes that are going to be turned on by this broiled steak that we know uh, promote aging and inflammation, autoimmune disease, cancer growth, um, those genes are going to be a totally different set of genes than those that are going to be turned on by this salad that floods the tissues with phytonutrients that are stabilizing, that quench free radicals, that promote tissue repair, the, that promote membrane stabilization. They, they give the chemical message to the tissues, shh, calm down, everything's okay, and it promotes tissue repair. And to say it in a sentence, your genes may load the gun, but your diet and your lifestyle pulls the trigger. That means you may have a, or your patient may have a genetic propensity towards developing a given disease. But whether that disease actually manifests in that person's body, largely, not completely, but largely, largely depends on the diet and lifestyle choices that person is making and the molecules they flow through those cells on a regular basis several times a day. Here's such a powerful illustration of this. This left-hand panel, this is a genetic readout of a man with early stage prostate cancer. And all these red dashes, uh, these are active oncogenes. They are promoting cancer growth. And you can see how many are, are active here. This man went on a whole food plant-based diet for six solid months, soups and salads and sticking veggies and chilies and curries and, and all the healthy plant-based foods uh, that, we're, that we're pointing out here. And six months later, they do another biopsy. Same man, same prostate, same genes. And look at how many of these red oncogenes have now been silenced and so-called turned green. What a powerful tool to, to see how food affects us on a daily basis. How can we withhold this information from our patients? They have such power to change their own medical destiny. Food changes us in one of two ways. It'll, it'll it uh, changes either directly, the way new 5GC turns on inflammation, that's epigenetic fun function, but also the food we eat changes the microbes in our gut, and they will change us uh, in a number of ways by changing enzyme perme uh, membrane permeability. Uh, and many of these or, uh, organisms produce neurotransmitters that get into our brain, change our mood, change our perception. Food is very powerful. And yet, 
because our specialist colleagues don't recognize it, they're all stuck like the blind men trying to understand the elephant. The cardiologist sees the atherosclerosis and the, and the gastroenterologist sees the Crohn's and colitis and the dermatologist sees the psoriasis and the rheumatologist sees the lupus and the endocrinologist sees type two diabetes. Um, and they're all puzzled. What's the etiology here? And none of them, because their training has been totally bereft of the awareness, they're all treating the effects of their patient's diet. Yet none of them really want to look at that. And I tell the young docs, when you open the door of the exam room, it's never just you and the patient. It's you and the patient and the patient's daily diet for the past 10 or 20 years. That's determining what you're going to see uh, in this patient's physical status. And that gives me great concern, therefore, to the folks following the paleo philosophy. Uh, that's just all, basically, it's a meat-based diet with some vegetables. People improve initially, they do because the paleo folks uh, say things I agree with. They pull out the dairy and the oil and the flour. They say, no caveman ever ate any of that. And you'll get healthier. You'll get leaner. You stop the dairy and oils, the flour products. You'll lose weight. That'll improve your blood pressure and your lipid profile. Yay. But I say, do not get seduced by these early beneficial changes. As time goes on, you keep packing that intestinal tract full of animal flesh uh, this, in my estimation, opens the door to an epidemic of colon cancer. What this is going to do to the TMAO and all that is going to do to their risk of heart attacks. They're going to get strokes. Now, the leaky gut they're going to get from the endotoxin will set them up for autoimmune disease. All the fat they're eating is going to block their insulin receptors. They're going to get type 2 diabetes. The microbes they spawn in their gut from the meat-based diet is going to invade the gut wall, give them colitis and Crohn's disease. And I showed you what AGEs, uh, especially from a meat-based diet, due to the arteries of the brain and the, the setting themselves up for an epidemic of dementia. So I don't care how good that steak may taste in your mouth. After a while, it doesn't taste that great. But do not fool yourself that this is a healthy way to eat. I think it's the, the pit yawns open uh, with these sharks swimming at the bottom of it. And for people who continue to think that we are, uh, that we're cavemen, uh, acting out the mighty hunter fantasy. Uh, that's not who we were. That's not who we are. Now, it turns out that a diet based on whole plant foods can, uh, can actually reverse these diseases. What an interesting concept. Disease reversal. I practiced medicine for 30 years before anybody put those two words in the same sentence for me. Uh, but it's, it is the hottest topic in, uh, in lifestyle medicine today and should be common knowledge among all our colleagues. I sure didn't know it in my first 10 years of practice, but I spent my first 10 years frustratingly uh, chasing numbers. Uh, I watched their, my patient's body weight go up, their blood pressures go up, their sugar levels, their blood went up, their inflammatory markers go up. Their, their, the dosage of prednisone and insulin I would prescribe would keep going up. Uh, and they kept and they got sicker. They got fatter and sicker. And I get calls from the from the ER that Joe just had a stroke or Mary's having chest pain. And I began to feel like a complete failure as a physician, a complete fraud. And I came to understand why so many doctors in their practice are leaving uh, because medicine is so unsatisfying if all you're trying to do is manage their chronic disease. Well, my head got changed about this on a number of uh, levels uh, throughout my medical career. The most important jump happened when I joined the medical staff at True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California, about an hour north of uh, San Francisco. Uh, and there at True North, uh, we have uh, the steady stream of American walking wounded coming in with all the classic diseases. Uh, but it's a residential place. They stay there for weeks. Uh, they can you can stay there just for a weekend if you want, but we encourage people to stay two, three, four weeks or longer. Uh, the pricing allows that. Uh, and while they're there, we don't raise their doses of medication. We actually feed them a diet based on whole plant foods, uh, oatmeal and fruit for breakfast, lunches and dinners are colorful salad, hearty vegetable soups, big plates of steamed green and yellow veggies, lovely curries and stir fries and uh, no oil stir fries. Uh, and um, and soups and stews, lots of fruit for dessert. This is the food stream that we would pour, or the patient would pour through their body, meal after meal, day after day, week after week. Well, the changes we saw there were nothing short of spectacular. 
Now, as the days and certainly as the weeks go by, the obesity begins to melt away. It doesn't magically vanish overnight, but it begins to melt away. And the arteries uh, begin to relax and die a little bit, and that lowers the blood pressure. And so you start getting them off their blood pressure meds. The uh, doctor, my joints don't hurt me this morning. Wow, it feels great. They have their first good bowel movement in months, maybe years. Uh, that certainly makes them feel better. The folks with the type 2 diabetes, fine. They can start reducing the uh, levels of insulin and uh, metformin. Folks with the psoriasis and the eczema, and the, gee, you know, is my skin's starting to clear up. The asthmatic, fo the asthmatic folks don't wheeze so much. They're all sleeping better. Um, these are the changes. Here's a, a, a typical uh, patient that that, uh, uh, that typifies this, at least. This is one of Dr. Furman's patients, actually, on the same basic program. Uh, Emily, I know her, a uh, lovely person. She uh, uh, started the program 100 pounds overweight on two medicines for blood pressure and on insulin. 11 months later, on a whole food plant-based diet, this Emily turned into this Emily, normal blood pressure, normal blood sugar, all for medications. I asked the medical students, what greater gift could you want to give to your patients to, than to help them achieve this health transformation? Isn't that why we're going into medicine? Or you just want to manage your chronic disease? You want to manage your obesity and manage your diabetes? You want to cure these people. Uh, why, why are you really going into medicine? It's a, uh, it's a golden opportunity for all of us. So, so we see these dramatic improvements, these dramatic reversals in diseases. But the question for today's lecture is how does this happen? Why does this work? Uh, what is the mechanism? Show me the science. So let's examine some of the possible mechanisms. So here we are, the patient is still back eating their standard Western diet, the cheeseburgers and buffalo wings and pepperoni pizzas. And here is the red tide marauders that flood through their tissues, through all their cells of every meal, meal after meal. When the patient finally reaches that point, so I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of being so obese. I'm tired of being sore. What do I have to do? The doc says I need to go plant-based. Okay, I'll go plant-based. And they finally make the commitment to jump in onto the plant-based train. Then the, the meat and the dairy and the oils and the sugar stop. And the steady nourishing stream of salads and soups and steamed veggies and casseroles and stews and soups, as I just showed you, start pouring through their tissues. What happens? Well, the first thing that happens with that transformation, making a boots-in commitment to go from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet, has this effect. First and most profoundly, the red tide marauding campaign stops. Respite. There is now time for healing to happen. Every cell in your body, every tissue in your body knows how to heal, but it can't do it. It can't get those mechanisms into repair gear if we're constantly upsetting the system with more fried animal muscle and, and fryer, French fried fryer oil. Uh, that's got to stop. And once that happens, the molecular marauders are replaced by a steady stream of whole plant foods. Let's look at what this does. First of all, this is now a high water content diet, all the soups and the salads and steamed vegetable water. And that now has water in the bloodstream and the water becomes less viscous, the less the blood flows more easily. The, um, the, the fluxes of water that are now flushing through the cells flush out uh, molecular contaminants. And as I said, the blood viscosity goes down. It's a more free-flowing bloodstream. Well, that works very well because at the same time, all the dark green leafy vegetables here are increasing the production of nitric oxide in the arteries of the, in the walls of the arteries. That lets the arteries walls dilate just a little bit but that's enough to, to lower the blood pressure. The pipes are bigger in diameter now, so the blood pressure goes down. They can start getting off their medications. But also now the, those slightly dilated pipes now let this less viscous blood flow through more easily, and it surges of blood carrying oxygen and nutrient pour through the capillary beds, pour through the brains, uh, bringing nourishment and removing waste from tissues all over the body. 
as soon as one pulls out the animal flesh and subsists on plants, then you've pulled out the arachidonic acid inherent in animal fats. And that's the main driver for inflammation. It drives prostaglandin 2 production. Well, you pulled that out. And now all the fats in the diet are coming from plant oils in, in the whole plant foods. And many of those fats are in the omega-3 family, and they are anti-inflammatory. So with that one move, you've changed the entire inflammatory balance of all the tissues in the body. How profound is that? Now, the, the free radicals that were, were, filled, were filling the tissues from the fried foods and the sugar eating and uh, other causes, um, all these colorful green yellow vegetables have antioxidants. They quench free radicals. They don't happily donate electrons, and they, they, they satisfy the free radicals' need for electrons. So they quench the free radicals. ROS is reactive oxygen species. Those are free radicals. Um, well, you quench them, so that lowers the oxidative stress in the tissues. That is such an important uh, factor to work with. When you change the food going through the intestinal tract, you're going to change the microbes that live in that intestinal tract. If you're eating meat and dairy, you're gonna spawn a population of bacteria from the bacteroides uh, phylum. And these are pro-inflammatory. They, they irritate the gut wall. They promote cancer growth. Well, you pull out the animal flesh and now you put down all that lovely high fiber resistant starches from the beans and the fruits and the vegetables. That's going to summon up uh, the beneficial microbes, the Prevotella microbes, um, whose byproducts are anti-inflammatory and they stabilize uh, gut walls to uh, uh, reduce the risk of, of GI cancers. And also, as I mentioned, because the Prevotella microbes uh, put out byproducts like serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine, uh, these are feel-good molecules that get into our brains uh, and people say, gee, I feel better since I went plant-based. That's not a placebo effect. That's a gift from your GI microbes that also change. When you stop eating the fat of other animals, your own blood lipids are going to improve and become less atherogenic, for sure. Uh, the, the oils in our diet, the fats in our diet, work their way out into our skin oils and determine our body odor. Well, there's the animal fats that as they oxidize, give the pleasant aroma of the Green Bay Packer locker room at halftime. Uh, well, many guys especially notice, gee, since I went plant-based, my wife says I don't smell anymore. Yes, that's true. Uh, and then it's a sign that the skin oils are generally getting more uh, health promoting. And that's one reason uh, why skin conditions, uh, eczema, et cetera, often improve. Uh, hormone levels improve. The cows are all pregnant in the dairies these days. So the milk, the dairy products have estrogens that increase man boobs and breast cancers and uterine fibroids. Well, you, and plus the cow's milk is baby calf growth fluid. It's full of IGF-1 for the calf. Well, you, you, those cause great imbalances in the body. Pull that out. Hormone levels will, will normalize. High protein diets that people seem to think is a good idea is not gentle with the kidneys. You eat a high protein diet and all those amino acids and the protein slam into the kidney filters, the glomeruli, and they force them to go into a state of what's called hyperfiltration. And uh, that's stressful on the kidney filter membranes. And as the months and years go by, it damages them, leading to chronic kidney disease. Uh, the, the, the mucus in the lungs becomes thinner, and less viscous. The asthmatic folks don't wheeze as much. White blood cell counts start going down, but people don't get infections. Uh, they, uh, the white cells count goes down normally because you're not pranging the bone marrow with endotoxin three times a day. So the white cells go down to a normal low level, which is where they're supposed to be. This is just some of the many changes that happen when one goes from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet. Uh, just let each one of these sink in. And when you look at all of them, when you ask yourself the question, what changes in the body when one goes from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet? The one word answer is everything changes. The entire physiology is different. The entire uh, oxidative stress state, the entire propensity towards fostering these diseases uh, has changed markedly. Uh, do not underestimate how powerful it is to go to a plant-based diet. 
So now let's talk about exactly how two main diseases, some two of the biggest killers in our society today, actually gets reversed. I'll show you the science of exactly how a plant-based diet melts away the plaques of atherosclerosis. Let's start with our professor here of natural eating. Um, the reality is we have basically the same digestive system uh, that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have. Uh, and they are up in the trees eating leaves and fruit and vegetation day in, day out. And lo and behold, they do not develop atherosclerosis or they don't develop type 2 diabetes in the wild. They die of injuries and parasites and infections and uh, trauma, yeah, but they don't die of clogged arteries, heart attacks and strokes or amputations, that's for sure. So when it comes to the number one killer in Western society today, let me make it very clear. Atherosclerotic plaque formation in the walls of the arteries is a disease. This is not normal aging, and it's not Russian roulette. Oh, well, your liver makes too much LDL. You're going to get a heart attack. No. This, the plaque formation is a disease that should not occur. It doesn't occur in hominids eating plant-based diet. Why does it develop in us humans? Um, Atherosclerotic plaques do not form in your artery wall just because your LDL is elevated. It is an active inflammatory process. These arteries are being injured. It's an inflammatory lesion. What is setting off the inflammation a lot more than your LDL levels? First of all, the endothelial lining, that precious one cell membrane that creates a nitric oxide that allows dilation of the arteries, et cetera, those get injured. Here we are when they're still in a nice, normal, pristine lining state. But what injures them? Well, surprise, surprise. Um, bacon and eggs for breakfast, uh, fried, fried chicken for lunch, uh, steak for dinner, burger for dinner, whatever. Uh, the very act of cooking that animal muscle sends oxidized cholesterol, animal fats, and protein and AGE through the bloodstream, and it starts damaging and injuring the endothelial lining. If you like fries with that, uh, with your burger or onion rings, these are sponges for the fryer oil that sits at uh, the temperature of boiling oil hour after hour. It's teeming with free radicals. And the, the fries and the uh, onion rings are filled with this fryer oil. That damages the endothelial lining. Um, if you're going to eat meat, you're going to generate uric acid. Uh, and that, along with the fructose in, in the in the milkshake or consuming or whatever. Uh, turns out that both the uric acid and fructose stimulate what's called, the, you, there are receptors for these AGEs on the artery lining. And when you set them off, uh, when you stimulate them, it unleashes a hellacious inflammatory reaction in the walls of the, uh, of the arteries. So that's uh, another factor, the uric acid and the fructose uh, damaging the lining. And if you like cola drinks, uh, what gives cola the bite on your tongue is the phosphoric acid. So you're drinking a loose solution of phosphoric acid. This is just some of the molecular onslaught that every Western meal sends through the blessing. Broccoli, you know, steam rice and steamed broccoli don't do this, uh, but the standard Western diet certainly does. And and so here's the oxidized cholesterol from from broiling the steak and grilling the chicken. That now that leaks through the now damaged endothelial lining to get into the walls of the artery, sets off the inflammatory reaction. And that's where the plaque comes from. It's the artery's response to the oxidized cholesterol coming into the artery wall. This should not happen. And again, uh, vegetable soup and, uh, and rice and beans doesn't do this. Now, the cardiologist said, well, once you get to this stage, man, you are in trouble. You, everybody needs statins at this stage, and uh, they're, they're all going to need stents. They're all going to need bypasses. Yeah, doctor, you don't talk to them about their, what they're eating. That's what you're going to see. But it doesn't have to be that way. Actually, this is a reversible disease through a whole food plant-based diet. How does it happen? Well, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn has made it very clear uh, with his program will reverse this disease. How does it work? What does Dr. Esselstyn ask of us? He asks, first of all, adopt a completely whole food plant-based diet. 
period. Okay, start with there. Stop the meat, dairy, oil, sugars, processed food. Stop all that. Stop the asphalt. Stop the red tide. Okay, we, want, we need a green diet, if anything. Okay. And along with the whole food plant-based diet, you want, you want it to be very low in fat uh, and, uh, so as not to encourage uh, uh, blood clotting or whatever. And he wants the person who's trying to reverse plaque out of their arteries um, to get uh, to eat a helping of dark green vegetables, broccoli, kale, chard, uh, at least a couple times a day, about the, uh, helping about the size of your fist. Why in the world does he want you to eat kale and broccoli three times a day? Because here is the key mechanism. When here is the classic uh, process uh, with the oxidized cholesterol. Well, I get. Whoops, sorry. Let me uh, go back here. Um, uh, this, these were oxidized cholesterol molecules that uh, were taken up by the uh, by the white blood cells and turned into those foam cells that become the uh, become the plaque. Well, as soon as you go plant based, the red tide stops. The constant barrage of, of oxidized cholesterol molecules stops. Now there's time for repair. And because you're eating a helping of, of kale or broccoli uh, in the morning, once again in the afternoon, once in the evening, it, it, you always have a helping of greens in your intestinal tract, and it acts like a time release capsule for antioxidants. These, the, the, the kale and the broccoli, etc., are constantly releasing these antioxidant muscles and uh, molecules into your bloodstream. And as they flow through the arteries, as the days and weeks go by with them always being in the blood, uh, they start seeping into the artery wall. And if they encounter any uh, free radicals, they neutralize them. That's what antioxidants do. And with no free radicals to uh, to neutralize, no oxidized cholesterol, there's no reason for the, these uh, macrophage cells to be here any longer that make up the plaque. So they leave, they outmigrate, And you can see it on the electron microscope, the focal adhesions uh, uh, break up, the, the, the foam cells start to leave. And as a result, the plaques get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the, uh, uh, and the uh, endothelial lining begins to repair itself, um, become thicker, not by magic, but because the uh, bone marrow is constantly putting out showers of stem cells that reupholster the artery uh, with like new paving stones. And as a result, you see classic studies like this. Uh, this will look familiar to some folks. This will be breathtakingly new to folks unfamiliar with it. But here is a coronary arteriogram. This is the, a man's left anterior descending in, in his heart. Uh, and uh, the entire die column of the artery should be about this wide all the way down. Uh, but when it hits this rat eaten portion here, these are atherosclerotic plaques encroaching into the, into the lumen of the artery, into the die column and giving this appearance. This man had severe angina every time he walked. Uh, he had to stop every 10 yards, take a nitroglycerin. He'd already had one heart attack. This man went on Dr. Esselstyn's uh, reversing diet, completely plant-based, little or no fats, and uh, the greens three times a day, the plaques melted away after 30 months of salads and soups and steamed veggies and kale and broccoli. Uh, the plaques melted away. This artery turns into this artery. Same man, same artery. But look how eminently reversible this disease showed itself to be. And if they melted away here, then they melted away in his brain and his kidneys all over his body. It's a truly artery healing disease. A heart, an artery healing program that should be. Uh, Dr. Uh, Esselstyn also uh, recommends that um, that the person uh, put a little bit of balsamic vinegar on the greens. Why? Because it increases nitric oxide production uh, in the artery wall. So that dilates the artery. Here's an artery wall. Well, arteries have arteries, of course, they're organs, they need a blood supply. And here are the tiny, tiny little blood vessels, the vasa visorum, uh, that supply the outer half of the artery wall. And you get that lovely vasodilation here. And a little bit of dilation means a big increase in blood flow here. But here's where the benefit really pays off. The inner part of the artery is nourished by the blood flowing through it. And if it's filled with those antioxidants and molecules that promote nitric oxide production, you'll get a dilate, a subtle, very subtle dilation, a widening 
of the artery, but that's a very important artery passage to dilate because of a law in physics, Poiseuille's law, that says just a small increase in the diameter of a pipe means a big increase in blood flow. Now, the flow of the liquid through the artery will increase by the fourth power of the increase of the radius. Uh, if the radius goes up, the, if it dilates by a factor of two, uh, the blood flow goes up by a factor of two times two times two times two by a factor of 16 to the fourth, two to the fourth power. So as a result, you get dramatic improvements like this due to, due to Poiseuille's law. If you can get those plaques to melt away a little bit and the arteries to dilate just a little bit, then you get dramatic increases in blood flow. Here's a cardiac perfusion scan. This is a heart muscle, uh, really deprived of oxygen. Red is good blood flow. You can see how little of it there is. This man went on a whole food plant-based diet for two weeks. Now, uh, the salads and the soups and steamed veggies melted the plaques in his coronary arteries away a little bit, dilated the blood vessels in the heart muscle a little bit, and this perfusion scan turns into this perfusion scan. Uh, in just two weeks, the changes are so profound. You get to read encouraging stories like Dr. Frey Ellis published. I read this in 1977. Now uh, he described a 65 year old man with severe angina. He had to stop every nine or 10 paces. Uh, went on a plant-based diet. Six months later, his arteries opened up and he's climbing mountains in the Lake District of England with no more angina pain. Arteries all over the body open up, much to the delight of people at home. Um, so, you know, you, as Dr. Rosler said, you're as old as your arteries. And man, if you keep those arteries open and supple, you are a young or youngish person and you're going to enjoy a vigorous life because of that. Now, a lot of people get all upset because of the, uh, because of their, cal but I got a calcium score of 400, doctor. What should I do about this? Yeah, what do we do about these calcium deposits in the walls of the arteries? Does that mean you're going, I got a calcium score of 400, doc. Uh, the, the patient, my cardiologist says I'm going to die soon. No, you're not. What do these calcium deposits really tell us? Here is my viewing of these, uh, of these plaques. The um, <clears throat> when there is chronic inflammation in the body, when tissues are chronically inflamed, the and the body can't deal with the source of the inflammation. Eventually, it gives up and it just packs the inflamed tissues full of calcium. It just petrifies them. Uh, we, if you've got a tendon rubbing over a bone spur there and it's getting irritated, eventually the body will pack calcium into that tendon. You'll get a calcific tendonitis. If you have a, a cushioning bursa over a joint that's getting chronically irritated, after a while the body packs it full of calcium, you get a calcific bursitis. The body will pack calcium into any chronically inflamed tissue, including the uh, arteries of the heart. Uh, if they are, because atherosclerotic plaque formation is an inflammatory process, after a while, as the years go by, the body gives up and just packs it full of calcium. So this man had that inflammatory fire of atherosclerosis burning in the walls of his arteries, clearly, and the body packed it off. But what does that mean for him today? What does that mean for you today? I view it like this. I few years ago, I went to the Gettysburg National Battlefield Monument in Pennsylvania, uh, where they fought the big Civil War battle. And you go into the visitor center, and there's this huge diorama display, half the size of a tennis court. And there's thousands of little plaster soldiers on the diorama, half of them painted blue and half of them painted gray for the Union and the Confederacy. And these are soldiers, so they're in their battle poses with their bayonets and their swords and their pistols. And they're portraying the battle. But what are these plaster soldiers? They are plaster soldiers. They are frozen in time. They are remnants. They are reminders of the battle past. And that's what these flecks of calcium are in, your, in the artery walls. They are signifiers of that inflammatory fire that was burning the arteries in the past. But it does not tell you whether you was going on your arteries now, it says your body successfully walled it out. It says you're capable of, of that inflammatory fire of atherosclerosis burning in your artery walls, but it doesn't tell you if it's happening now. And that's all that matters because these calcified plaques do not rupture. They do not pose any threat. 
They're a marker of what was happening in the past, but it's the soft plaques that rupture uh, and cause the clot that stops the blood flow in the heart. And those soft plaques do not show on the scan. So if you've got a calcium, okay, fair enough. And actually that calcium is doing you a favor. It's stabilizing those old plaques. But it's not going to get not going to go away. The your calcium score is not going to go down. You'll want it to go up. It might go up a little bit if you because it, there's an inertia that keeps going. The, the as you change your diet tomorrow, you're going to have continuing inflammation for another few months or a while longer. So the calcium may continue to accumulate, but the threatening atherosclerotic plaque formation uh, will be arrested. Uh, and this does not necessarily say uh, that you're at high risk if you go plant based. Show me the science. Well, if you if you do searches on plant-based diets and angina and claudication, uh, you will see that now we're getting lots of studies showing up describing the reversibility of plant-based diets, the reversibility of, of, uh, of uh, atherosclerosis to be reversed by plant-based diets. And um, the... Uh, where are we going there? Um, okay, and... Uh, here is what is high blood pressure uh, will improve on a plant-based diet, congestive heart failure, kidney failure, um, a plant-based uh, diet for kidney disease. Uh, it's starting to happen. Show me the science. There's now getting to be more and more solid science by saying we are planting any hominids, follow that diet, and these diseases often reverse. Now, can you be a vegan and still get this disease? Absolutely, you can. I've got two male patients, long-term vegans. They're vegan for the animals, um, but one is overweight. He's a baker. He can't stop eating the uh, baking and eating the vegan cupcakes and donuts and, and cookies. Uh, and the other one's a bachelor. He says, Doc, I live on peanut butter and fruit juice. I drink gallons of fruit juice every week. And both of these guys developed official coronary artery disease. Uh, uh, my overweight baker uh, already has two stents. My fruit juice guzzler um, is, uh, may have to get a bypass. Um, so we need to talk about that. So when I hear, oh, I knew a vegan and he got heart disease. First of all, how long has he been vegan? He's been eating a standard Western diet for 60 years and he's just been vegan for a year. I'm not surprised that his arteries are no longer pristine. It takes quite a while to reverse it. Um, so when you hear, oh, a vegan got heart disease, well, how long has he been vegan? Vegan since birth. You raise a child from birth on a whole food plant-based diet, their arteries will remain pristine. This, will, this process will never happen in a person who's been raised on a whole food plant-based diet all their lives. So I have to ask, what were they really eating? Was this a vegan junk food diet filled with free radicals and advanced glycation end products damaging their, their artery walls and oxidizing their cholesterol? Then what was their stress level? Are they on a strap for, for money and family problems? Because walking around with high cortisol levels from stress is not gentle with your, uh, with your artery walls. Are they hypothyroid? Uh, low thyroid function will raise your cholesterol and possibly put you at risk for this. And because a vegan diet can be low in iodine, are we looking at uh, subclinical hypothyroidism from an iodine deficiency? Make sure there's a good source of iodine in your diet, sea vegetables or a supplement. Now, if you don't have enough B12, um, a substance called homocysteine is going to start building up in your bloodstream and that can damage your artery walls. So it's another reason besides your nervous system is not to neglect B12. Don't just blow that off. It can come back and bite you. And one way it can is a heart attack and stroke spawned by uh, high homocysteine levels there. So make sure that's not an issue uh, for our vegan who developed um, clogged arteries. And finally, if all of these are negative, nope, I've been uh, plant-based for 40 years and no stress, normal thyroid, normal B12. Uh, there's some evidence that in, in some people, at least some of this inflammation is set off by an infection uh, with an organism like chlamydia pneumoniae, uh, H. pylori. Uh, and if, if all of these are negative in a vegan with heart disease, I do antibody PCR testing for these organisms to make sure uh, that's not really what's setting this off. Because if so, then the course of antibiotics might really be helpful for this person. So for those rare rare vegans uh, who do run afoul of this disease, again, it's largely uh, diet or thyroid or B12 issues, but worthwhile thinking about the infection. 
Okay, so that's how cardiology uh, can be positively affected by uh, uh, by a whole food plant based diet. If you want to learn more about it, go to my website, drclab.com, and see my uh, video called Beyond Cholesterol. And I go through why uh, vegans with high cholesterol are not necessarily in any danger. They do not necessarily need statins. If you're a vegan with high cholesterol, do yourself a favor. It's a short video. Go to drclab.com and find my, under resources, find my video Beyond Cholesterol, uh, and it'll put your mind at rest. Uh, while you're there at drclab.com, I invite you to download my health supported eating plans, a four page handout to get people started. Uh, it gives them lots of videos to see and hints to how to lose weight, et cetera. Uh, I could spend two lectures on just how each one of these organ systems benefits from a whole food plant based diet. Uh, and I can assure you that there's plenty of protein, um, uh, healthy eating day of plant-based food can easily give you 80 or more grams of protein. Uh, I've never met a vegan who's eating a diet of, based of these whole foods to be protein deficient. People say, well, it's expensive to eat this way. No, it's not. Uh, the truth is the, the staple foods that provide the calories and the protein, the rice and the beans and the lentils, the cheap uh, you can buy a 10-pound bag of, of rice for a little over six and a half bucks. You can buy 10-pound bags of lentils for a little over $12. Well, that's a month's supply. If every day you have two cups of rice and two cups of lentils in some form, a soup or a rice and lentil dish or whatever. But uh, 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 two cups of rice and uh, two cups of lentils will give you 46 grams of protein. If you kick it up to four cups of rice, uh, they'll give you 53 grams of protein. Uh, and it's pennies a day. And the food assistance program pays for this. So for people who say that I can't afford it, if you buy the, the, the grains and the legumes in bulk, uh, it becomes cheap. You can make up a stew or a chili that lasts for days and feeds a lot of people. And if you're not putting out money for steaks and ice cream, you've got money to buy organic broccoli and, uh, and sweet potatoes. Okay, let me talk about one last disease about uh, how plant-based diet actually reverses the disease. We're talking about type 2 diabetes. This is such an important study here. Uh, back in 1927, uh, Shirley Sweeney uh, took medical students. He's, 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 a med, he's a physician teaching medical students. He took medical students from his class and divided them up into three groups. And one group, um, he fed a high-carbohydrate diet. The next one, a really high fat diet. The high carbohydrate diet folks were just eating, were just eating for just for two days. Sugar, candy, pastry, white bread, um, uh, baked potatoes, maple syrup, bananas, rice, and a high, high, high carbohydrate diet. Um, they did, uh, and after two days of that, they did a glucose tolerance curve where, where they had them drink, um, drink 100 grams of, of glucose. And two hours later, they checked their blood sugar. And two hours later, the vast majority of these young med students, they were all back down you know, below 110 range, which is back basically to normal after 120 minutes. After two hours, their blood sugar were back to normal. A high, high carbohydrate diet did not uh, make them diabetic. Uh, they were able to handle more sugar quite easily. But the folks who were eating the high fat diet, and then for two days, all he let them eat was olive oil, butter, mayonnaise, egg yolk. 20% cream, okay? This is a high fat diet for two days. He did a glucose tolerance test on these guys and girls, uh, mostly guys back then in med school, gave them a 100-gram drink of glucose, and two hours later, checked their blood sugar level, and virtually all of them were in, frankly, diabetic range. They were all in the 160 or higher range. After They all had a, a diabetic curve after two days of fats. It's not the sugars, it's the fats that lead to insulin resistance. How does this happen? Well, um, most sugar is burned in the muscles in the liver. So here's a muscle cell. Um, it burns glucose. You eat an apple and glucose shows up in the bloodstream. You got to move the sugar into the, into, the, into the muscle cell to burn it. But if the person's been eating a standard Western diet, uh, and keeping the blood full of fat hour after hour. As the, as the days go by, the fat uh, oozes into the muscle cells, start accumulating there as intramyocellular lipid. There's fat in the muscle cell that starts blocking the insulin receptors. 
This is not theoretical. Here's what it looks like under the light microscope. Uh, this is striated muscle tissue and all this black stuff. This is fat in the muscle cell. This is intramyocellular lipid in the muscle cell does not belong there. Under the electron microscope, again, this is fat in the muscle cell doesn't belong there. This is intramyocellular lipid. What is it doing? Why? How is it causing the problem? Well, here's what normally happens. Sugar shows up in the blood. The pancreas puts out insulin. The insulin plugs into the lipid, to the insulin receptor on the muscle cell. And when the insulin plugs into the insulin receptor, that activates two kinase enzymes symbolized by this K and this K. And when these kinase enzymes get activated, that turns on the GLUT4 mechanism that pulls glucose into the cell and through a vesicle mechanism. This is how sugar enters the cell normally, but insulin has to turn on these two kinase enzymes. Well, if the blood has been all fatty and the, and the cells are full of intramyocellular lipid, then what you have is this situation. Uh, the fat is built up in the mitochondria. They're getting oxidized. They're full of free radicals and generating ceramides. And the oxidized ceramides and free radicals inhibit these two kinase enzymes. So insulin knocks on the door, but nobody answers. Nothing happens. And as a result, the GLUT4 mechanism is not activated and the sugar piles up in the bloodstream. And you got high blood sugar. Ooh, don't eat sugar. The high sugar is the tail of the dog. Now that's that's just the effect. The problems is fat in the in the diet, clogging up the the enzymes needed to pull sugar into the cells. If you want to read about intramyocellular lipid and insulin resistance, there is an increasing literature on it. And if the person happens to be obese, that adds another layer of insulin resistance. How? Because the fat in the abdomen is metabolically active. The visceral fat puts out inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1 and 6. And here we are back in the muscle cell. The, um, uh, here's the intramyocellular lipid clogging up the enzymes of the insulin receptor. But here comes those inflammatory cytokines from the obese the abdomen, and they interfere with the insulin receptors from the outside. So no wonder so many obese people develop type 2 diabetes. Uh, the, those insulin receptors are clogged from the inside and, and the obstructed from the outside. Well, uh, is the answer just more insulin and more metformin? And how about Ozempic or Jardians that makes you pee out your sugar in your urine? Is that the answer? No, it's not. This is a completely reversible disease. If you still have a functioning pancreas, this should be a completely reversible disease. You stop the meat and the oils and the dairy and the, and the oxygen and the AGEs and all that stuff. And you go on a diet based of whole plant foods. And what happens? Well, the fatty onslaught stops. The muscle cell still needs energy. It looks around, hey, I've got energy already in here. Look at all this fat and this myocellular lipid. You know, well, let's burn that. And the stored up intramyocellular lipid gets thrown into the mitochondria and burned for energy. And as obesity begins to melt away, the, the inflammatory cytokines start fading away. So the insulin receptors open up and find that they start working and the diabetes starts going away. And here's a Barnard's classic study where they compared a low-fat vegan diet and the conventional diabetes diet. And the folks on the low-fat plant-based diet had a greater improvement compared to the Diabetes Association diet. They had a better improvement in their hemoglobin A1C. They lost more body weight. Their lipids improved more. They, their kidneys healed. They lost more less albumin in their urine. And all of us who practice lifestyle medicine have patients like Jim in our practice who used to be 100 pounds overweight on 30 units of insulin. He went on a whole food plant-based diet, lost the weight, uh, lost the insulin, and now he's running marathons, diabetes-free. This should not be the exception. This is uh, not a uh, um, uh, not standard results. These are standard results. Uh, and they're, they're within grasp of every patient who is struggling with type 2 diabetes. It forces the doctor to learn a lovely skill called deprescribing, how you learn to back these patients off their insulin and metformin, et cetera. And show me the science, uh, do the searches you'll see, and come back. This is recorded, so come back and, uh, and stop this, the, the video here and look up uh, these studies here documenting uh, how reversible type 2 diabetes can be. Obesity melts away 
uh, this is this diet is mostly fiber and water. The calorie density is so low. You can, how many apples can you eat? How much salad can you eat? How much vegetable soup can you eat? It's mostly fiber and water, and it winds up uh, melting away uh, excess fat without having to count calories or restrict your carbs or anything like that. Uh, <clears throat> inflammatory arthritis, it's an anti-inflammatory diet. We don't have time to go into the mechanism, but that often improves, including rheumatoid arthritis. And if you're struggling with autoimmune diseases like lupus, um, I urge you to get a book called Goodbye Autoimmune Disease by Dr. Brooke Goldner, um, a, a physician who put her own lupus into remission with a plant-based diet and, and green smoothies. It's just a gift to us all. And uh, she does consultations. You can connect with her. Uh, of course, as the red tide slurry whistles down through the intestinal tract, it's not gentle with the gut wall that's transporting it, of course, uh, and all the red tide marauders there uh, cause inflammation of the gut wall, and that's going to uh, set off uh, Crohn's disease and colitis uh, and uh, yeah, you get these folks on a plant-based diet, have them cut back their meat eating to a little bit once or twice a month. And you get these prolonged remissions. It really is a, is a fundamental, is the first step in, in uh, gaining control over inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, here are people on the semi-vegetarian diet. To, these are days, you know, two years afterwards, uh, they stayed in remission. The asthmatic folks, show me the science. The asthmatic folks wheeze much less on a diet uh, of whole plant food, especially if you pull out the dairy, notorious for making asthma worse. Uh, the folks with the eczema and the psoriasis notice their skin often begins to clear and uh, there are strategies to uh, uh, to uh, accelerate that. Show me the science. I urge you to get this wonderful book, Plant-Based Nutrition and Clinical Practice, uh, and, and half the book uh, is scientific citations and documentation, just an excellent work. And if you'd like to know more about how uh, plant-based medicine and lifestyle medicine is used in practice, uh, I urge you to get Dr. Sri Stancic's book, What's Missing from Medicine, and she'll talk about how uh, the, these uh, strategies can actually be implemented to, uh, uh, to the benefit of both patients and their physicians. And yet, most doctors, it's embarrassing. That's why I'm doing Moving Medicine Forward, to get this message into the minds and heads and hearts of these young doctors because patients say, my doctor doesn't know anything about nutrition. He scoffs and wishes me out of the room. And I, as soon as I mention my diet, he rolls his eyes and says, it doesn't make any difference. Why is this? We're doctors were not taught about nutrition. It's not respected as a science. It's a sissy science. And the dietitian, you give, give him a diet. Don't bother me. I'm up in the operating do room doing real medicine. But what are you doing in that operating room, doctor? You're dealing with the infections and the infarctions and the amputations from what your patients are eating. You're all dealing with nutrition-based diseases that could be largely reversed in the outpatient clinic with a good plant-based dietitian. Plus the docs are eating the same burgers and pizzas in the hospital cafeteria and in the restaurant. It's, it's a tough sell. And as a result, it's embarrassing. My profession, uh, uh, it's embarrassing to me. The, uh, the, the, the complete ignorance that gets passed down from generation to generation uh, of young graduating physicians when it comes to the effect of their patient diet on the diseases they're spending their careers treating. Uh, we don't want to hear about it. We don't want to think about it. And as a result, real patients are dying on real operating tables from procedures they may not need that could be reversed with a whole food plant-based diet. When I asked her, I said, do you ever talk to your patients about nutrition? They said, listen, I don't know what to tell them. I don't, I've never been trained. I don't get paid to do this counseling. I don't have time to do this counseling. Don't bother me. This is not in my wheelhouse. Well, the good news we're trying to get across, you don't have to do the counseling, doctor. There are trained professionals who are more than happy to do this counseling for you. Every city I'm in, I do a search for plant-based dietitians, and the screen fills up with them. And, uh, and it works beautifully for telemedicine consultations. There's lots of nurses now leaving hospital medicine. They can be great coaches. Um, this is uh, eminently available uh, to uh, patients anywhere. You don't have to be in the same city uh, to take advantage of these plant-based counselors. 
Well, people are not going to change what the yes, they will. You know, they they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. My patient Ken uh, was 25 pounds overweight on medicines for diabetes and high blood pressure. 12 weeks on a plant-based diet, lost um, 20 pounds off his meds. Uh, people can change, and they do change. Uh, he used my four-page handout, which I recommend. So the concept of disease reversal is a hopeful one. It's becoming well-established. In fact, there is now an international journal of disease reversal and prevention. It's a free journal. I urge health professionals, anybody you want to uh, subscribe to it, learn about how these processes are happening. And progress is starting to be made. Here's Wayne State University putting a mandatory course in, in plant-based nutrition for all first-year medical students. Good for you, Wayne State. And I hope other schools start to start uh, using that as an example. If you want to learn about it, I urge my physicians to go to the website of the University of Winchester and take their six-week course in online plant-based nutrition. Superb course. I took it and learned a ton. Uh, go to PCRM, Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine, download their nutrition guide onto your cell phone. So if you're faced with a patient with colitis or Crohn's, you'll, uh, you'll know what food they ought to be eating. You can make a career out of this. Here are my colleagues at uh, Rochester Lifestyle Medicine uh, who uh, uh, do such a great job, at, with, especially with their Jumpstart program, uh, helping people uh, healthy up their diet. I urge people to join the Plant Nutrition Project. I'm almost at the end. We'll take questions just in a minute. Um, uh, the plant-based nutrition uh, can be a, a conference can be attended in person or online. I urge people to take advantage of it as well as joining the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and international students can join the uh, Physicians Association for Nutrition. If you're looking for a plant-based doctor, you can find one, a lifestyle doc who advocates plant-based medicine at Love Life Telehealth. Uh, so if you're looking for a plant-based doc, uh, here's the place to look. So, we're at the end. Moving Medicine Forward is our nonprofit initiative. Uh, and I'm going to medical school after medical school in person or by Zoom, hospital after clinic, giving the message that plant-based nutrition can help reverse chronic disease. And it is, it is career shaping. No matter what specialty they are in, they can benefit by using, by knowing about and instituting plant-based nutrition for their patients and themselves. So that's the science behind disease reversal through plant-based nutrition. I hope some of it was meaningful and useful to you. Uh, and with that, I will open the floor for questions. Uh, and uh, I will, I think that automatically stop the share. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so okay. much, Dr. Clapper. That was, a, that was a very informative and powerful presentation. So um, we're now going to be... We're now going to begin our live Q and A, um, and you, you've kind of shared where everyone can can reach out to you and all the resources that that you recommend. So that's great. Um, where where can they get your uh, your books? I believe you have a, a you know. Uh, go to my website, drclapper.com, and everything is there uh, that you're interested in. Perfect, perfect. So all right, so now we'll begin the the Q and A. Just want to explain a few things to the audience. We don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise their hand. If you're not sure how to do this, what you need to do is click on the reactions button, second from the right at the bottom of the Zoom window, and then select raise hand. When I call your name, I will unmute you and, and ask you to state where you're from and to ask your question. And we just ask that you keep your questions uh, brief and on topic. So uh, with that, I will uh, start off with a uh, an audience member here. Um, let's see here. Uh, Dominique, please state where you're from and question. Hi, my name is Dominique. I'm from Canada and I've been uh, listening. I've been listening to Dr. Clapper for uh, many, many years and I'm always um, flabbergasted about what you say, Dr. Clapper. Thank God you are here. Um, and I am so happy that you are doing this uh, to, with um, medical students. And I was wondering how those medical students react to your teachings about plant-based. Are they, do they believe you? Are they skeptical? Do they ask questions? Are they excited? I'm really, really curious about that. Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour from Montreal or Quebec City, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, um, so the, uh, the response I've been getting from medical students has been uh, beyond uh, wonderful. Um, 
First of all, my way has been made a little easier because in every med school class now, there's 10, 20, 30 students. They've seen film, they've seen forks over knives, they've seen what the hell, uh, the, the light's on. They already are open to the idea that food has something to do with these diseases here uh, and that's potentially reversible. Uh, and then I give them a similar lecture where I've just showed you. I've, I, they, they need to see the science as well. And um, and the response I've been getting, uh, the students have been very enthusiastic and empowers them. The, uh, the in medical school, uh, you you want those tools, man. You want to learn how to use diabetics to make that edema go away. You want to know how to use beta blockers to increase cardiac output. Uh, you want those tools to make those diseases go away. Well, this is the most powerful tool of all. It will actually reverse these diseases, not just control the symptoms. So when they realize this, they are very excited, enthusiastic. Um, and, and we go right to the students. We do an end run around the faculty. The administration does want to hear this message. It blows their financial model, their intellectual model, but the students are open to this because it's the truth. And so in general, long answer, but we're getting a very positive response. A couple of them are a little perplexed and it's new to them. But again, the invitation is to learn more about them because they're going to learn good things. So thank you for that question. Thank you, doctor. I I'm going to ask the next question. So um, you, you, you know, I know that the thrust of this was about, uh, you know, whole food plant-based diet. Is there a place for supplements? And if so, what supplements would you recommend are, are the most important for, uh, for well, people who are uh, As I mentioned, absolutely do not neglect vitamin B12. It's the one substance. Uh, we used to get it from drinking out of streams and eating unwashed vegetables. It was, it was from made by soil organisms, but nobody's eating unwashed vegetables. Nobody's drinking out of streams. And for that reason, natural B12 has disappeared out of our diet. So you got to have something with a few micrograms of B12 in it a few times a week. Uh, if you don't, you risk the, your brain and spinal cord. And as I mentioned, you risk homocysteine levels going up that will uh, set you up for heart attacks and strokes. So do not uh, neglect taking some methylcobalamin or cyanocobalamin at least three times a week. So and a fortified food is, is fine. Um, that's the only one you really, really need. Um, if you're not eating sea vegetables and, and, and it's all commercial produce, the iodine level might be kind of low. If you do take a supplement, there's some decent uh, uh, plant-based, vegan, low-potency uh, uh, multiple vitamins that have some iodine, some zinc, some vitamin D in it. Uh, these seem, and some B12. I, I don't have any problem with you taking it. It's kind of an insurance policy, um, but you but you could get those others from a whole food plant based diet. But B12 for sure, and think about supplemental uh, 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 iodine, uh, vitamin D, uh, and zinc. Uh, our next guest, Dr. Joel Furman, uh, talks about um, EPA and DHA. As right. A, yes. And I've started taking that again myself. I stopped for a couple of years. My DHA and EPA levels took a nosedive and I've started back on, on taking them again. So I, I'm reluctantly, but uh, I just, uh, don't, my, my cerebral function is important to me. So for, it might be complete placebo, it might be doing no good at all. But yes, I did go back on after while watching my omega-3 levels march steadily downward after I stopped taking it. Okay, great. And, um, so many speakers talk about having no salt in their their diet. There's a book there's a book called The Salt Fix, which recommends salt. What are your thoughts on salt? Should be completely avoided? Is there a place for? It? Is it is it um, is it beneficial as as this book recommends? Right. Uh, most people, uh, uh, unless you just have runaway high blood pressure and you are on six medicines to try and keep it down. Um, most people have no problem with literally a pinch of salt. That's an eighth of a teaspoon. Um, and it's got uh, oh, the, less than 150 milligrams of, of sodium in a pinch. And so if you put a pinch of salt on your veggies three times a day, um, you get a big salty hit on your tongue for very little actual sodium. And, I, and no one is really going to get in trouble with that small amount there. Um, so uh, people say, I don't, we, we took the salt shakers off our table. Well, that's the one place you've got control of the sodium. Uh, at the restaurant, it's already in the spaghetti sauce, it's already in the soy sauce, uh, and in the, the frozen dinner, or whatever. That's it's in the processed foods where the sodium is. If you stop eating the processed foods, 
and these are all soups and salads and things that you're making. Uh, yeah, a little a little salt on the surface of your baked potato or your corn on the cob is fine. Just just hold the total amount of salt during the day to less than an eighth of a teaspoon, and you should be fine. Great, thank you. And I, I know you have a lot of experience with uh, with fasting. Um, should people fast? Should people intermittent fast? And if they should do regular fast, how long should they they uh, do a fast for? Right. Um, it's not a good idea to be a grazer and just keep eating all day. Why? Because especially if you're eating carbohydrates, that means you're every time you eat uh, carbohydrates, your insulin level goes up. And if you're constantly eating and grazing all day, you're keeping your insulin level up hour after hour, after hour, after hour day after day. And that's uh, not a great way to run the system. It may increase fat storage and pro-inflammatory reactions, et cetera. Uh, insulin is meant to go up when you eat a little sugar, but then you gotta let it come down for a few hours and let it go back down to baseline there. So given that, um, uh, you know, eat, eat discrete meals as much as you can. And many people are finding that, you know, I just need one big meal in the middle of the day and that's enough for me. Wonderful. Uh, most animals eat like that. And it was, um, and that opens up a lot of non-eating time before and after that big meal. Or if you just want to have two meals a day, a late breakfast and a midday meal there, if that's enough for you, wonderful. No one says you must eat three meals a day. Uh, and so find the amount of food that's right for you at the time that's right for you. But it's, but behind your question, there is the issue of, uh, of fasting. When the body is without carbohydrates, which is our, we are sugar burning organisms. We are, we, that is our main fuel, not fats. Uh, but if after 24, especially 48 hours, you stop taking in carbohydrates, you stop the, the, the beans and rice, et cetera, um, sugar levels fall. The body has to start burning stored fats. You go into the state of ketosis. And good things start happening. Inflammation goes down, cancer growth gets, gets suppressed, antioxidants build up in the tissues. It's a good thing to start entering that fasting state. Uh, and it helps to rejuvenate the body. These molecules called sirtuins get, um, get uh, uh, synthesized. And for that reason, the, you get the philosophy of intermittent fasting, where you don't eat for 18 hours. So you, uh, you have your last meal at, at say, eight, eight at, uh, seven, six, 6 in the evening. Don't eat again until, uh, well, 6 in the morning goes by as 12 hours. And then another, don't eat again until 10 in the morning. Then, then you've got another, what, 16 hours of fasting. Have you gone into ketosis? No, but those early changes as the body's getting ready to go into fasting states, inflammation's going down, antioxidants are building up in the tissues, sirtuins are building up. Um, good things are happening as you just enter that fasting state, put your toe in a little bit. So that's the so-called advantage of, uh, of intermittent fasting. You, you put your toe in the water into fasting land on a, on a daily basis. And theoretically, as the weeks go by, you'll, you'll, your body will, will benefit, especially if you've got inflammation going on or whatever. Um, is it essential if you don't have inflammation? Um, we've gotten our, we, our diet has changed. We don't eat big dinners anymore. We, I have a late breakfast and a, and a late afternoon, midday meal, and that's enough food. And maybe I have a little fruit in the evening and that's about it. So everybody should work with it, but the less time you spend eating, the better. Your body is doing good things in that off time. And, and you mentioned, um, cancer. Can, um, can fasting prevent cancer? Can it, can it be a, a treatment for cancer? And are there other diseases that fasting, um, helps prevent or cure? Oh my, it's a, such a question. And cancer is such a complex uh, condition with so many causes where we breathe carcinogens, we, we eat them, we, uh, and we generate them, they're in our food, they're in the water. Uh, and so to say, oh, this eating or not eating this one food will prevent cancer. Well, that's asking a lot. Um, that said, eating a whole, you know, there's so many carcinogens produced when you cook meat and when you eat animal products. The very act of going plant-based really decreases the, the onslaught of carcinogens. So that's going to reduce cancer risk. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the body does enter an, a, a, a state when you're fasting that really works against um, uh, cancer growth. Um, the uh, when the body goes into ketosis, the, the blood's becoming a little bit more acid. 
Um, th that signals the, uh, uh, the body that put out less IGF-1. That's going to inhibit cancer growth. Uh, it's also going to pack the uh, uh, the cells up with antioxidants because the body is getting more uh, acidic. And so these are all good changes that are happening in the cell. Well, cancer cells can't do that. Um, they just, all they know, divide, divide, divide. That's all, they're just dumb old cells there. And so they don't build up their antioxidants, et cetera. And they become more susceptible to chemotherapy. Uh, I, I tell my breast cancer ladies that if you're scheduled for chemotherapy, don't, don't say anything to the oncologist, but go in on day two of a water fast, or day three of a water fast, and you'll get much more effect out of that chemotherapy or out of that radiation. So in that way, um, uh, cells uh, can respond to the fasting state. And while I was at True North, we had two patients with a lymphoma, a very watery tumor that went on a long fast and their lymphomas melted away. Now, not all cancers will react like that. They're all very different. Uh, but absolutely, fasting can have an anti-cancer effect. Will it magically abolish? Okay, I can't say that. But it's an it's a, it's a arrow in the quiver of people to both prevent cancers and to treat them. It's something worthwhile. If someone's dealing with a cancer situation, learn about fasting. Get Dr. Walter Longo's books, L-O-N-G-O, and, uh, and learn about uh, using therapeutic fasting as part of your treatment plan. Great, thank you. And our next question is coming from Cynthia. Please state where you're from and ask your question. Okay, hold on. Okay, uh, this my name. Uh, my name is Cynthia, and I'm from New York. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Clapper, for the awesome presentation. I really uh, learned a lot of great information. Uh, I just would like to know about the. Uh, I had calcium score of zero and a carotid artery Doppler. I would like to know is soft plaque uh, revealed on the results or only. Uh, you know, hard plaque only on the results. Because I was told that soft plaque is not shown on the, uh, on the results. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, the important question, if you've got a calcium score of zero, are you at risk for developing plaque in the artery? Yes, you are. Depends what your, it says you haven't developed in the past, but the question is what's happening in the arteries now? Um, I mentioned in my presentation just now, um, that I have a video on my website called Beyond Cholesterol because I have so many vegans with high cholesterol. And the gist of that is, listen, it's an inflammatory process. And as plaque is building up, the six inflammatory markers show up in the bloodstream, HSCRP and myeloperoxidase and prostaglandin, et cetera, et cetera. I said, if your cholesterol level is up, have your doctor draw these six markers that, uh, that I have in my video there. Uh, and and also get an ultrasound scan of your carotid arteries. Um, if the if the inflammatory markers, all six of them, are negative, and your carotid arteries are clear and pristine, you don't have the disease. Even though your, your cholesterol might be two forty, cholesterol is not an evil molecule. Your your adrenals make uh, steroids out of it. Your ovaries make estrogens out of it. Your uh, your liver makes bile out of it. Your liver is making it for a reason. It's not an evil molecule. Uh, and if your cholesterol was 230 on a given test, well, on that morning, your adrenals say, hey, we told your liver, we need more cholesterol for steroid synthesis. Or your estrogens, or your ovaries told your liver, we need more cholesterol for estrogen synthesis. And the liver obliged. And when that needle went in your vein, at that moment, your liver needed to keep 220 milligrams of cholesterol in your blood. But that's not the disease of atherosclerosis. That, that disease is artery abuse. It, it is the result of how the owner of those arteries was treating those inner linings. It's an active inflammatory process from repetitive injury from the animal-based diet. Uh, if you're not doing that, if you are just eating rice and beans and greens and fruits and veggies, uh, get those inflammatory markers if you want. They'll be negative. Get on with your life. You don't have the disease and uh, it shouldn't be a, a worry for you in that case. Don't worry about the calcium score. If anything, check those inflammatory markers. Our next question comes from Judy. Judy, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, um, my name's Judy. I'm from the Philadelphia PA area. And um, my question is about the AGEs. Um, if you are baking like a um, plant product like uh, tofu or nuts, should we be concerned about 
uh, baking them at a high heat should the temperature be below a certain degrees? A uh, fascinating question. Um, the a uh, couple of things. First of all, as long as and I know you specifically talked about baking, and that's an important issue. As long as, as you're making any kind of food, as long as water is involved, if you're steaming broccoli, if you're making a soup or you're making a stew, or uh, uh, you're just in a double boiler with, with, with lots of steam coming out from the bottom there, you're safe. You're not going to create AGEs, you know, and that's really the way to get heat into your food is, is use water in some shape or form. Now, once you get into dry heat cooking, uh, baking, you know, uh, but certainly broiling and frying, all that, evil things happen uh, to the food at, at that point. Now, of that, uh, you know, frying is the worst thing to do. Frying oil is the worst thing to do. Uh, and broiling under that flame, that, that's just barbaric. I wouldn't eat anything broiled. That said, if you're baking tofu, especially if you breaded it, uh, and just in the oven, will you create AGEs? Probably just a tiny amount. Uh, yeah, there'll be some, but uh, but if once a week you wanted to have some baked tofu, uh, I don't think it poses any threat to your health. Enjoy that, but but avoid the deep fried tofu and that anything that's fried should not be consumed by human beings. Thank you. And so um, some of the the speakers that we have um, say that, um, you know, you should eat nuts and seeds for uh, for health. You know, the healthy fats, you know, are, are good for you. Um, and and then you have some people, I know Esselstyn on his strictest, um, in his strictest cases, there's there's no fat. Uh, that's it. That's exactly what he does. I think. Um, where, where, what are your thoughts on it? What, what do you um, see the research saying? Sure. Okay. Um, Doctor Esselstyn, bless his heart, uh, developed his uh, theories and pro program uh, dealing with the worst of the worst cardiac patients. Their arteries, every one of them, was, was all, were all caked up with plaque. They had they had heart attacks. They had stents. They had angina. If you're in that category, yeah, you do not want to be eating nuts and seeds and oils. And the, 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 that's like throwing gasoline on a fire. You don't want to do that. Um, but if you don't have artery disease. Um, there are some benefits in, in nuts and seeds. There's all sorts of antioxidants, vitamin E, et cetera, and omega-3 fats in walnut, et cetera. Um, and so one, it depends. Uh, if you are on Dr. Austin's plan, don't, don't, then, and you really need to be there for your angina, don't be eating nuts. That's true. But if you're not, um, I say a, um, uh, hold nut, all nuts and seeds to a small handful a day, period. A uh, small handful of walnuts to eat them one at a time, make walnut butter in your mouth. After, you know, what, what Dr. Justin's afraid of is if he says nuts are okay, then he's afraid of someone sitting in front of the TV with a five-pound bag of roasted cash you shovel them in by the handful, which is what humans do. And he doesn't want to open that door there. But and I've asked him, do you really think in a normal healthy person, no disease, or a couple of walnuts is going to cause any any threat? No, of course it won't. So, um, so, uh, but again, the, the amount is the issue. And so uh, hold all nuts and seeds to a small, modest handful a day and enjoy them. And to the greatest extent possible, eat raw nuts as opposed to roasting. Once you roast it, you oxidize the oils. They taste better. I, I'm a big fan of roasted cashews, but I've stopped eating them. Uh, so uh, uh, definitely uh, 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 hold the nuts to a very modest amount, but I think they have a legitimate place in the diet unless you're an Esselstyn patient. So um, Dr. Joel Furman has um, said that he's seen some of his long-term vegan patients come in with, uh, with dementia. Have you seen anything like that in, in your practice? And um, why do you think he is seeing you know, some of his patients coming in with, with dementia after eating um, a, a vegan diet? Yes. Um, I have not seen patients on vegan diets with dementia. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, and Dr. Furman believes it's because these folks here were chronically deprived of sufficient DHA in their diet. And so that's why he advocates, he feels that's the missing link that opens the door to dementia there. Uh, there's lots of uh, that theory that needs to be tested. It'd be nice to follow people uh, for, you know, you know, from age 30 to, to 90 and see what they're eating and, and, be, and checking their DHA levels and see what happens to them. But those studies haven't been done. All the studies or these conclusions are drawn are just uh, correlational studies, observational studies are not really solid. 
but he has a point and it's, it's got me to uh, concerned enough to start taking the DHA again. So, you know, it might be a thing, but he believes it's a, DHA, it's a DHA deficiency. Right. Our next question is coming from Alice. Please state where you're from and ask your question. I'm from California and I'm curious about vitamin D and having a critical lab value and being on 120,000 units of vitamin D per week. Is there any harm to be on that for months and months ongoing because can't get the level up? 120,000 units of vitamin D yeah, a week? It's, yeah, it's, it's 50,000 per prescription and 10,000 over the counter every day. Right. Wow. Um, that has me a bit concerned uh, for a couple of reasons. There is, there's definitely a condition of hypervitaminosis D. You, you can certainly get toxic from too much vitamin D. Uh, and the, um, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the uh, vitamin D is activated um, in the kidneys. Uh, and people who are in kidney failure can't activate their vitamin D. And as a result, they get what's called renal rickets uh, and they lose calcium because they, they can't activate their vitamin D. And these folks, this is who that 50,000 unit dose of vitamin D was made for. The, the, this is for patients in renal failure who, who need a big goose of vitamin D because uh, they can't- well, that's not me. Exactly. That's the point. And uh, because of that, uh, I get concerned about- the doctors who prescribe these huge pharmacologic doses of this stuff, what is that doing long-term to your kidney health, to your bones, your whatever? We don't know. Um, but I have concern about you want to find the least amount that will, will get you, will keep that level up in the 30 or better range. And so I would work on, on scaling every week. I would cut every month. I would cut back by another 5,000 units and get that down to a more reasonable amount. And with, and with, and with, that, and with that dose, uh, believe it or not, the highest I've gotten is between 13 and 20. Then that might be all that your body needs or requires. Um, you know, that's a bell-shaped curve, you know, and there are folks out in the eye and the tails of the curve there that may need much less. And you might need one of those bodies, uh, might need a lower dose. And for us to be flogging okay. your body more vitamin D, I, I think we might be going against nature there. I would get it up to 20 and take take the money and run. I wouldn't push it past that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And we have about two minutes left. Um, so I just want to ask a, a, a real, um, you know, I just want to make it, if you can make it brief. So Brian Clement talks about um, fruit being an issue potentially uh, with some of his patients. So he he recommends that people don't eat fruit or, or avoid it. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on people avoiding fruit? Are there any conditions um, that that should cause a person to avoid fruit? Um, I do not believe so. I think fruits, they're mostly water. They come in with vitamins that, that nourish the tissues on many levels. Uh, there's no, he's concerned, sugar feeds cancer. Uh, and so don't, so don't eat fruits. Um, yeah, if you, uh, if you want to avoid cancer, don't be drinking Coca-Colas and, and, and bags full of Oreo cookies. I agree that kind of sugar uh, may well uh, contribute to cancer growth. But how many apples can you eat? Uh, I think uh, the uh, concern over fruit is is misplaced. The, the high fruit eating folks do not seem to get more cancer. So prima facie doesn't seem to be a risk problem. So it's a theoretical thing that I think does actually uh, cause negative benefit here. I think it scared a lot of people off fruits that I think would benefit from it. So I'm not in that camp that fruits cause cancers. All right, great. And we have about one minute left. Is there any thoughts you want to leave us with with that one minute? Um, hope. Uh, these are reversible diseases. They get caused by the food stream and the lifestyle that we're flowing through our tissues on a daily basis and get on the diet we were meant to eat, like the gorillas know all about, uh, and, uh, and watch the magical healing forces your body will unleash and set into motion. It's, a, it's so exciting and so uh, inspiring and hopeful that uh, we have this control. You don't have to play helpless victim uh, to your disease nor to your doctor there. So take your health in your own hands. Meal by meal is how you cre uh, create a healthy body. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll just be friends instead of doctors and patients. Great. Thank you so much, doctor. It was so informative. I, I appreciate it. Um, please unmute the audience. 
And I want to thank you again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.